Uh, we're first going to talk to Lada Shelkovnikova, who is a Singapore-based lawyer and a Ukraine refugee volunteer joining us here in Singapore. And Paweł Domanski, who is the Country of Origin Information Unit of the Polish Office for Foreigners. And Paweł is joining us uh, from Poland very early this morning. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Paolo, thank you. Uh, thanks to you both for for being with us today. Thank you for having us, Glenn and Neil. Appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. And Paolo, since since you're bleary eyed right now, and 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 the one that's uh, then gone through the most uh, challenge to be with us, let's go ahead and start with you. And normally I would go ladies first, but since you're right there on the border, um, what what's the situation like right now? How many refugees have you guys been dealing with, and and what's happening? Uh, yeah, hello again. Many thanks for, for having me. Uh, now the situation is uh, a bit better that, uh, uh, than uh, and, uh, 24th of February and just after it. So the number of people um, fleeing from Ukraine is a bit lower than at the beginning of the, of the war. Uh, also, the, the, the number of people uh, which are coming to the refugee centers, refugee points uh, at the border is also lower. So, for instance, at the, at the refugee center uh, at which we, we work together with, uh, with LADA, uh, now daily maybe the, uh, yeah, more or less 600, 1,000 people uh, going through it. Um, at uh, at one moment, usually there is um, more or less three hundred to five hundred people. Well, um, wow. uh, and Powell, if we can just stay with you for a second, for the benefit of our listeners, just to update, there's more than five million Ukrainians have now fled the yeah. country. That makes it Europe's biggest refugee crisis since World War Two. I don't know how specific you can be. I appreciate safety and security elements are involved but for the benefit of our listeners maybe you can tell us where you are and what you're seeing uh, where you're based on a day-to-day -day basis okay so at the moment i uh, i stay in warsaw uh, so in the center of uh, of poland more or less uh, most of the refugee centers refugee points temporary points are located at the border with ukraine uh, but there are also several uh, such recep reception points uh, for refugees in uh, bigger cities of the of the Poland. So more or less altogether, there are something like uh, 40, 45 or 49. I, I don't remember exactly uh, the, the number, but it's m more than 40 such uh, such points. Uh, yeah, this uh, this looks a bit uh, different than uh, during other uh, refugee crises. Uh, like during the war in Syria or Iraq uh, or in Afghanistan, so there are, there are not uh, there are not such uh, tent camps um, or or uh, uh, or other such of of big refugee camps. Uh, people fleeing from Ukraine um, usually uh, at first uh, stay in this in this reception point for refugees at the border. They stay there for one, two days, maybe three days, sometimes longer if they wait, for instance, for their, uh, for, for, their, uh, for members of their families uh, to join them. And then uh, they go to other bigger cities in, in, in Poland or just uh, straight away go mm -hmm. to other uh, countries in uh, European Union. Uh, and uh, some of them decide to go to uh, to such countries like Canada, United States, but then they have to stay uh, two, three weeks, uh, sometimes uh, maybe a bit longer uh, in Poland or in other countries waiting mm -hmm. for for all the uh, you know paperwork, uh, visas, and and such such things. Uh, so, but but most of the people uh, coming from from most of the refugees coming from 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 Ukraine. Uh, it's it's estimated like more, more than more than 60 percent of them uh, they uh, coming to Poland they already know where to go because they have some relatives in Poland they have some uh, some friends al already uh, living uh, here or in other EU countries uh, so yeah they, they 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 just go straight away to 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 their to their family members to their to their friends um, yeah. 
the, the, the others uh, are welcomed by uh, by by Polish people so uh, a lot of a lot of refugees just uh, live at homes mm. uh, with with Polish families um, but there are also you know other other places opened uh, for, for 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 refugees like uh, hotels or, or, or some hostels uh, yeah. there are places uh, organized in in, in schools uh, um, yeah in some sports centers and so on so uh, people are distributed all around the country and uh, now mm. also all around the Europe as well uh, Pavel, if I might just say from the, from the outside view looking in that, you know, the people of Poland and the government of Poland have engendered such goodwill around the world for being so open and willing to uh, to bring in, uh, you know, women, children, old people, everybody that, that has need and to try to help them. And, and I'd like to um, to shift now to Lada. Uh, Lara Sholkovnikova, who is a Singapore-based lawyer who has spent a lot of time working with the the refugees. Lara, you were there a couple of months ago on the border, really, and you had quite a harrowing story getting to where you ended up. Um, but based on where you were then and what you're seeing now, give us give us your feeling of what's happening currently with the refugee uh, situation there. Look, it's um, every day is is a different day, and because the needs change on a daily basis. Those who came in the first months or months and a half, that was the biggest wave. Um, and those people still had a chance to evacuate. The reason why on a number of occasions um, you'll see the numbers going down um, currently is because people simply cannot evacuate. And they would want to, but they can't. And they held hostage as, as a life shield. So when it may seem um, on the outside that the situation is better, well, frankly, it's not. And okay. um, I'm afraid that the worst is likely yet to come. Um, so mm. I want to give a little bit of color um, of a volunteer story of mine and Powell's story because a lot of people are asking me, so, you know, what did you do there, right? And, and they have thousands of stories to tell. Um, and every story is, is something that I relive when I tell it. Um, so first of all, Paolo and I, we're both, we're helping people financially. So if you see a mother crossing the border with a little bag in one hand and the child in another, or an elderly woman, you know, having just a half a bread loaf in one hand and a little bottle of water, you can't simply think that, you know, letting them leave like that and, and you know, hope that there will be a, a mercy of fate, that's not good enough. So both Powell and myself we were giving um, financial support directly um, to those people on the border. Second, we were planning commute. Now you have to understand that people who come to the border, um, nine out of 10 don't speak any English because they come from little villages and, and small towns with little education, let alone English language capability. So. As a translator, would they be speaking? Would they be speaking Russian or, or Polish? Ukrainian, or the, Ukrainian, Ukrainian, yeah. Ukrainian. A little bit of Polish uh, depends mm -hmm. on if they're from Western part of Ukraine. They would understand Polish at least. Okay. Um, but but Pavel also speaks Ukrainian and Russian, so um, that that was really sure. helpful. And we were planning commute for them because imagine you're coming to another country you've never done like you don't know what google search is right you don't even know how to get to from a point where you are to you know a city somewhere yeah. on on the western side of poland or let alone outside of poland so we were planning commute for them through trains um you know to make sure they can get there for free and you know to get to the trains they would get through the buses and sometimes the commute will be you know anywhere between 10 hours to 48 hours for instance to get to portugal um, so we were naturally also translators and, and you know shoulders to cry on frankly um, yeah. we procured humanitarian aid um, and we found the the uh, we actually procured with our own funds found a way to transport it through the border into Ukrainian side to those um, hospitals and clinics that accept um, injured in Ukraine despite the missile attacks so we would have contacts and this is an incredible volunteers network that you know somehow it just comes together one volunteer knows the other the other one you know, knows someone else and one message from a little town in Ukraine can pass 
through you know to someone in Poland through like 10 hands and then you would finally get this message that okay these are the needs for surgeries in that hospital in Ukraine and there is no one else you can pass it on so what you do you just go and procure it and then find a way to transport it into Ukraine like you can't just expect that someone else will do it for you so we, we just did that and, and yeah. then finding the way to transport it in another problem right because those people who are actually transporting it from Poland to Ukraine they're risking their lives um, actually risking their lives going through those roads with mines and everything so that was another challenge and and of course we were you know we were finding homes and when I say mm -hmm. we were finding homes for people you know for some of you it may sound easy because you know you just you just go hotel or Airbnb <laughs> but now think about it right yeah, we're talking about finding a family homes for families for free for an indefinite period of time in a country that is flooded by millions of refugees already and has no space left now yeah. this mission is mission impossible and me and Powell and I'm, I'm so grateful to Powell because he was literally my mountain there we would spend hours both of us sitting on the phone calling all possible numbers and, and yeah. they would give numbers just to find a space to another family of refugees mm. that we found mm. and then when we were lucky enough to find that guess what we had to find a transportation because all of those little <laughs> villages and towns they're anywhere between four to eight hours away from where we were so guess what there are no you know volunteer um, mm. private cars standing in line saying where you want to go it's not a taxi service that is providing service for free so yeah. we had to do it ourselves and Paolo so literally and every drivers. room literally every room literally every seat in every vehicle matters uh, these days yes is that yes yes yeah. yes sometimes we would squeeze three people in two seats yeah sure of course of and Paul yeah. on that point you know we're almost approaching day 60 in the invasion I have noticed it slipped a little bit down the news agenda it's still covered it's still covered but you do fear that the global populace may move on a little which brings us nicely to a question from one of our listeners you know Stanley asks what happens now for the refugees what would you like to see happen now and I'm assuming you don't want it to fall away from the public consciousness so you Powell what do you want to see happen now for the refugees of Ukraine uh, I, I, I would like uh, I would like um, all the countries all the people uh, stand together to support uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, I would like them also to to support uh, countries which uh, host them as well because in longer terms uh, it will be really really difficult uh, to uh, to maintain uh, you know uh, good level of of, uh, of living for uh, for ukrainian uh, citizens uh, in other countries uh, of of course uh, you know, children should go to, to, to schools and they are going, but uh, as Lada said, uh, this conflict is uh, prolonging now and uh, we, can, we can see worse uh, scenes uh, in, in the future as well. Uh, hopefully not, but, but it's, it's uh, yeah, we should be ready for this. Uh, mm, you know, there will be, there will be problem with, with um, places at uh, medical centers, at hospitals, um, and so on. So, so uh, all the uh, all the support uh, is, is is really needed, uh, financial yeah. support, but also uh, in any in any other way, uh, like uh, good word and uh, also political support from other countries. And uh, all we should be conscious that uh, this conflict, although it might seem to be far away from from some countries uh, also like uh, for, for for singapore for instance but it really may affect uh, all the other countries because uh, mm, mm. It's, it's it's very violent it's uh, it's it's very costly for 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 all sides of the of, of this conflict yeah. it's, it's very costly for 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 the you know big part of uh, of europe and asia as well yeah. Yep. Uh, as some uh, mm, you know uh, supply lines uh, are, are cut down now uh, yep. and and insecurity uh, arise also uh, in in surrounding countries uh, so so it may it may have really huge uh, bad effect bad effect uh, 
on the on the on the markets uh, all uh, all around the world. So, yeah. Paolo, uh, Paolo yeah. if I can just jump in, uh, uh, two questions, quick questions. One, are are you looking for more volunteers? Do you want people with specifically language skills to come to Poland to help in any way, or is there just too many people already? That's the first question. Second question is, I believe that there are some um, Ukrainian bank accounts or something that people can donate to. Uh, what's the best vehicle for people to? donate to make a difference we know you know people here bless their hearts are trying to put together care baskets and things but it's my understanding that that is just a logistical problem for you uh, to try to disseminate you know first of all get the shipping in there and then get it to the people that need it so wh what's the best way that that people can help you from where you're sitting right now in warsaw um yeah i i think it's uh, the the best way is to uh, is to make uh, is to provide support through the uh, through the organizations through the individuals who uh, who already have some uh, have some experience some knowledge uh, who who has been here who has some contacts here uh, they uh, they simply know what are the what are the needs at at, cent at certain moment uh, they they can contact uh, their uh, their partners in, in in Poland in other EU countries and just uh, receive and and also in Ukraine because a lot of support is needed uh, also directly to, to to Ukraine as well to, to all the volunteers working there uh, so so they these people, these organizations know uh, know the uh, the needs at, at at certain moments. So so it's 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 the best way to to mm. uh, to be in contact with with them. And what con what concerns uh, volunteers? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly uh, certainly such uh, such help is also uh, is also needed. Is uh, uh, but uh, you know. Um, yeah, mostly mostly are needed people who uh, who speak uh, Ukrainian or Russian, just mm -hmm. to just to be able to communicate with uh, with refugees. Uh, right. Uh, so to react, uh, you know, in the best possible way for the uh, for, for for the needs and just to uh, be able to calm down them uh, somehow, uh, just to talk them. Uh, how Lada said, uh, just to you know cry together with them sometimes uh, just to understand better what is what is their situation uh, what did they uh, went through uh, yeah. yeah Lada we'll just give the last word to you if we can when Glenn and I saw you speak so eloquently on this subject I think you mentioned the best donations are to a Ukrainian bank maybe you can just uh, elaborate on that and secondly you know you mentioned there Lada it's probably sadly tragically going to get worse before it gets better what we feel so helpless sometimes in singapore watching this happen when it does affect us directly it affects our wheat supplies it affects our sunflower oil it affects our supply chains as uh, pavel mentioned what can singaporeans do thank you so much Neil, for that uh, look everyone can help no matter where you are no matter what you do um we only can stop this war and i can't emphasize enough we only can stop this war if we all come together and so no. first things first raise awareness and i do encourage everyone to apply the critical thinking to look at the facts to look who is fighting whom and how they're fighting it and then when you applied your critical thinking and when you made your when you made your mind just raise awareness to help ukrainian people because every word out there helps to alarm everyone around it. And it's not a movie and it's not somewhere far away. It's actually closer to our homes than it may seem. Second, if you know businesses that are still doing business in Russia, we have to stop the bloody trade. We have to make sure we don't fund the mass murderers. And this is important. Every dollar of tax paid there is a tax that goes to fund the war. And the third is, of course, donations. No matter how small, every gesture counts. Every penny can save someone's life because when all of us stand together, it just becomes an enormous voice, an enormous yeah. factor. So I do urge you to uh, donate to, a you can donate to whatever you want. There's so many different 
platforms for humanitarian aid, but in my case, if you ask me where I donate, I donate to the National Bank of Ukraine, which has a separate, special, designated account for humanitarian aid. And the reason why I chose that over other platforms, which are also donated on a numerous occasion, but the reason why I chose that is because it goes straight to the center of the need. It doesn't go through 1,500 layers mm. of approvals mm. or, or the ways to find the transport, the help to the Ukraine. It goes into Ukraine directly. So if you want to make it efficient and if, and if you want your dollar to help immediately, that's the best way. National Bank of Ukraine, just Google it and we go, you will go straight to the National Bank of Ukraine web page. Yeah, and and Lada, if you want to put any of those links in our Facebook Live uh, uh, chat, we we'd love for you to do that, and Pavel as well. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have to leave it there. We would love to have you both on again in coming weeks uh, to to further tell us how things are going and what else needs to be done. Uh, in the meantime, thank you to Lada Shelkovnikova. Uh, based here in Singapore, uh, a lawyer, and Pavel Domanski, the Country of War in Origin Information Unit of the Polish Office for Foreigners based in Warsaw. We very much appreciate your time and wishing you, especially Pavel, on the front lines, all the best. Thank you so much for having us, Glenn and you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks Thanks to you. Stay bye safe bye. and Thanks. stay well. Yeah. You too. Bye. Bye.